good morning. Uh, thank you for your attendance. I will call the uh, meeting of the Air Pollution Control Board to order. The first thing on the agenda this morning is the public hearing. Would the staff uh, please submit the amended uh, agreed board order with the Murkison Desert River Company, Mr. King? Thank you, Chairman Hilton. The district brings a VOC Knox rack plan with a, uh, ASRC to the board for its consideration. The American Synthetic Rubber Company operates pursuant to a Title V permit, and they have applied to construct and operate three natural gas-fired boilers, each rated at 200 million BTU per hour. District Regulation 6.42, reasonably available control technology for volatile organic compound and nitrogen oxide emitting facilities requires the application of RACT to processes emitting VOC and NOx. Because of past ozone issues in Louisville, uh, we have a regulation that requires the application of RAC to major sources of VOC and NOx. As you're aware, we have a current designation of non-attainment for ozone, so this is still a very important rule for us. Uh, the ASRC is applied to construct two or three natural gas-fired boilers uh, with the overall intent of removing the existing boilers, two of which are coal-fired. We've proposed uh, that VOC racked uh, be good combustion operating practices. Add-on controls are not utilized uh, to reduce VOCs through combustion processes. Uh, so applying this complete efficient combustion will minimize VOC emissions. Uh, the facility would be required to follow the tune-up and maintenance requirements found in the Federal Maximum Achievable Control Technology or MACT regulation for boilers. In that rule, it's designed more to uh, control toxic pollutants, but again, that good, complete combustion will also minimize non-toxic VOCs. Uh, the more important part is the NOx rack, the nitrogen oxide rack. Uh, for this, the district proposes a limit of 0.04 pounds per million BTU on a 30-day rolling average period. To give something to compare to, the current NOx rack for the facility uh, requires 0.5 pound per million BTU per hour, per, per million BTU or less for coal boilers and 0.2 pound per million BTU uh, for the gas boilers. So this is quite a bit lower than those limits which were set almost 20 years ago. Uh, this will be accomplished with the use of low NOx burner technology, so it's not an add-on control device, but it's really controlling how well that uh, combustion occurs. ASRC, under this proposal, would be required to conduct annual NOx testing uh, for two years. If the facility is found to be in compliance with that testing, uh, the performance test will be required every two years. The district recommends that the board adopt the agreement as proposed. And as a note, these new boilers will go through the construction permitting process, uh, which will look at all rules, all requirements, uh, monitoring and record keeping to go with that. Um, we hope the public notice that permit soon. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor King. Uh, would a representative of the Merkin Center and Rubber Company like to make a statement? Does anyone from the public wish to make a statement? Are there any questions by board members? So we have another. Uh, item that we need to uh, address, and that is the uh, uh, regulations uh, 1.08, administrative procedures, version 14, regulations 2.08. This is, has to do with the uh, fees, uh, version 28. Uh, Mr. Gary. Thank you, Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, the district brings for your consideration today amendments to Regulation 1.08, Administrative Procedures, and Regulation 2.08, Fees. Uh, regulation 1.08, Version 14, uh, makes amendments to bring the administrative procedures for requesting open records uh, into alignment with the Kentucky Open Records Act, uh, and clarifies different purposes and procedures for public hearings and the procedures for amending our rules. Uh, regulation 2.08, Version 2, uh, version 28 would allow the district to refuse to process additional notifications for asbestos 
demolition or renovation projects where the applicant has unpaid invoices more than 60 days overdue or has unpaid late fees or outstanding court judgments owed to the district. Uh, the district received no comments during the comment period and recommends the regulations as amended be adopted by the board. Thank you. Uh, does anyone from the public uh, wish to make a statement? Does anyone else want to make a statement? Uh, are there any questions by any board members regarding this uh, amended uh, regulations? There have been no further statements or questions. Uh, this part of the hearing is adjourned. So we will move into our uh, four seat agenda. Um, we do have a quorum. Uh, Mr. Talley, do we have any uh, introductions this morning? Yes, Chairman sure, Milton, we do. I'm happy to uh, introduce a new employee, Zachary Strainy. He is a new engineer one in our industrial compliance area. Thank you. What? Thank you. Uh, public recognitions? <coughs> no, sir. Uh, both of you have um, the uh, policy committee and the regular board mi uh, minutes have been distributed in advance of this meeting for your review. Are there any corrections uh, to the uh, policy uh, com uh, committee minutes or to the uh, regular board meeting minutes? And the uh, public uh, hearing meeting minutes. Are there any um, Questions regarding the uh, distributed minutes? Hearing none, um, the um, hearing uh, minutes are approved, and so are the regular board meeting minutes are approved. Thank you. And the policy committee meeting. Uh, we have to, um, do we have any public comment this morning? No, sir. Any unfinished business? No, sir. Sure. New business. With the new business, uh, you've heard the district uh, rec uh, district uh, recommendation. Is there a motion to adopt the amended green board order with the American Synthetic Railroad? Get a motion from the board member? Okay. Is there a second? Any discussion regarding the um, agreed board order of Marcus with that Okay. Uh, we cannot, uh, uh, we can vote, but Mr. Sullivan, the vice chair here, um, will uh, recuse himself uh, from not voting on this a uh, Marcus with that rubber pending. Um, regarding his uh, family's um, involvement with a nonprofit that raises funds in the community. Uh, so to make sure we have no conflict, uh, he has uh, accused himself from voting on this uh, report on it. But we do have enough to vote. Uh, board members, are you ready to vote on your report or the members of that? All opposed? Eyes have it, the agreed uh, board order with the American Synthetic is adopted. Uh, we also have <coughs> proposed amendments to Regulation 1.08, Administrative Procedures, Version 14, and Regulation 2.08, Fees, Version 28. And you've heard uh, the district recommendation. Is there a motion to adopt the proposed amendment to Regulation 1.08 and 2.08? Can I get a motion from a board member? So, is there a second? Yes, Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the regulations are adopted. So next on the agenda is the uh, <coughs> committee report from Mr. Uh, <coughs> Steve Sullivan, is the chairman of the uh, policy committee. All right, thank you. Uh, 
The policy committee of uh, the rural air pollution controllers from board met on October the 16th, 2019. And during that meeting, the committee uh, approved that the district propose amendments to regulation 1.08 and 2.08 be released for the 45 day public comment period. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we down to uh, staff reports, Mr. Town. Thank you, Chairman <clears throat> So this morning I will attempt to keep my remarks brief. Uh, we have a presentation later, part of the director's report that I think the board will find of, of great interest, and so I want to make sure there's enough time for that presentation and then for adequate question and answers. However, uh, there are a few items that I do want to bring uh, to the board's attention. Uh, concerning EPA's budget, which is always of concern, uh, 103 and 105 grant funding, uh, uh, as it stands now, is proposed to be held at the current levels, and so 103 and 105 are a large part of our funding mechanism, and our understanding at this point uh, is that it will have the same level of funding that we've had in past years. Uh, of course, this is also uh, dependent on getting a final budget approved at the federal level. So, uh, good news, and we'll wait to hear the final one. The Louisville Sustainability Council held its 2019 uh, Louisville Sustainability Summit on November the 1st. Uh, uh, Rachel Hamilton, myself, uh, Tom Nord, uh, Jamie Jonka, and was anybody on there? Torn. Oh, I'm sorry. Torn and Bradley. Torn and Bradley. Torn and Bradley. Torn and Bradley were uh, at that meeting. And Michelle. <laughs> It was held at the Louisville Zoo. This is an annual meeting by the Louisville Sustainability Council. Very featured speaker this year was uh, Dr. Robert Brinkman. Uh, his topic was entitled, Seven Ways to Advance Your Sustainability Agenda in a Time of Change. Uh, it was really very thought-provoking uh, discussion, some of the issues facing us uh, due to climate change. There was also a panel discussion uh, on local issues related to climate change issues uh, in Louisville. And on that panel were Mary Ellen Mewalk as Chief of Global Forward, Cindy Sullivan of Trees Global, Arnita Gaxon in the audience this morning uh, from West Jefferson County Community Task Force, and also from the NAACP Climate Change for, and Environmental Justice for a Kentucky representative, and then also Kurt Barrett of the Louisville Energy Alliance. Uh, it was just an opportunity for, the, for them to discuss some of the issues that are just specific to Louisville, and then also to entertain questions from, from the audience. Uh, again, it was a, a good event uh, and an annual event, so I encourage folks that they have the opportunity to, to attend in the future. Rachel and I also attended the Mayor's Strategic Planning Retreat uh, that was held, and so uh, it has not been finalized, but I, I, I feel like it's important that I give you the five or the, the seven uh, uh, five priority, area, uh, priority areas that the Mayor has established, and they are public safety, climate change, affordable housing, anti-displacement work, uh, youth involved 502 alignment, and youth, the transition of the youth detention services. As you know, due to the budget constraints, uh, detention services for youth in Louisville are being turned over to the state. And then something that I'm very happy that they included, something that APCD has made known to, to HR that we've discussed with leadership, and that is they had a one of the priority areas is succession planning, recruitment, and retention. And that is a particular problem to, to the district, more so than some other agencies. So just very happy that that, that has made it to the, the top of the marriage strategic planning, because it's an important issue uh, that needs to be addressed. The other important thing about this, and different from prior years with the Marriage Strategic Plan, is that uh, part of the process is to, to develop smart goals, timelines, and supportable KPIs, which are key performance indicators. And we also created, within each of these sections, a hopper of things that not directly related, but things that need to also be addressed and make sure that we get to. But more importantly, the plan is to keep those working groups for each of those sections together to uh, to work on these throughout the year, and that has not taken uh, place in the past. And so one of the things that you always want to guard against when you do 
strategic plans is to do a plan that simply sits on the shelf, nobody takes a look at it, and nothing gets done. And so I think they've seen that as part of this year's strategic planning event uh, is going to allow for us to stay involved in that process to make changes as necessary and needed uh, in the strategic plan and keep the folks who have to implement this plan involved in the process. So very, very happy about that. Rachel and I also had the opportunity to attend a meeting at the uh, Shawnee Library, and it was a discussion of Chickasaw and Shawnee Park. Uh, the presentation by representative of Metro Parks, and the discussion was about the addition of services and programs that have long been offered for other parks throughout the community, including Jefferson Forest, that will now be offered at Shawnee and Chickasaw in West Louisville. Uh, so it's just incredible to hear about it. And we're talking about such things as canoeing and archery. And a lot of those services were available. Children in West Louisville had to travel to Jefferson Forest or the other parks in order to take advantage of them. The plan now is to have those same, everything that's offered at other parks to be offered at Shiny and Chickasaw. So uh, just, I think, a, a great opportunity to, to address some of the equity issues that, that are, are occurring in uh, our community. In addition to that, they're also going to build a multi-purpose building in Shawnee. Uh, the drawings were impressive. It will be available for community use. And then it will also be available to provide some of those services and programs that occur elsewhere. They'll have a site now in Western Louisville in the parks, uh, in Shawnee Park, for our, that community to take advantage of those programs and services. So uh, the other thing that was talked about was the cleanup of Chickasaw Pond. So that has long been an issue in, in Western Louisville contamination in that pond and so the fact that they are now planning to clean it up and restock it with fish uh, is, is a blessing. I remember fishing there when I was a kid. I also remember when they put up signs that said you can no longer fish there. So it is uh, a step in the right direction for, the, for them to do that. Now there was some areas of contention because of the past pollution in that pond. The community had concerns about cleaning out because part of the plan is and they dredge the pond to make it deep enough to, to have fish in it again. Uh, they plan to take that sediment that's dredged out and do some leveling and some other landscaping work within the park. And so the community had concern that they were putting contaminated soil in those areas. Uh, that soil has been tested and, and the folks who do that have said that they are at safe limits. But the important thing about this conversation was, from my point of view, was the fact that they are committed to having some additional discussions uh, with the community or some other issues that the community brought up. And so, very pleased that they will continue that discussion, they will address some of those issues that the community is having, and the fact that this is going to move forward, I think it's going to be a, a, a benefit to, to the West Global community. Uh, and I think they'll get all of the questions that the community uh, has answered before they move forward. There was also a meeting that I was unable to attend. I was at a conference, but it was with the California Neighborhood Association, MSD, APCD, and this meeting was with Heaven Hill. And this was to address a multitude of issues from that community related to Heaven Hill operations. Everything from odors from the sewers, from the Heaven Hill stillage of flowing into the sewer system, to noises at night that come from the operations at the plant, uh, to the mold on their homes. And so there was a long list of things that the community wanted to address and they had the opportunity to do so uh, with Heaven Hill. I spoke with the lady who was representing the California Community Center, her name is Yolanda Walker, uh, and she had a follow-up meeting with Heaven Hill where they confirmed what they heard were the issues that the community had expressed at that meeting. So she was able to, to make sure that they understood those concerns and issues, uh, and she's to get back with Heaven Hill, uh, or Heaven Hill is to get back with them to address out tell them how they plan to address those concerns. The other thing was part of that request was uh, uh, consideration for a public hearing on a uh, permit that is outstanding with Heaven Hill. Uh, she asked that that be held up. Uh, permitting manager may be aware that we can't indefinitely hold up that permit. And so uh, I tried to reach out to Ms. Walker this week. I will make further attempts. We are more than happy to hold a public hearing if that's what the community wants. If they get answers that are satisfactory to them and don't want to proceed with the public hearing, we can do that. We are also not opposed to having a community meeting that will include APCD, Heaven Hill, MSG, uh, 
uh, to address questions and ask and provide answers to the issues that the community has. So we will follow up on that. We will follow the lead of the community in terms of what they think is going to work best for them. But I wanted to make the board aware that this community discussion is taking place. Since the last board meeting, we have had two clearing the air workshops on October 21st. We had Ozone Part 2. And then we had the last uh, clearing the air workshop of the 2019 year on November 18th. And this was the STAR program in environmental justice. Uh, I think we had a great conversation. This was this past Monday, uh, this past Monday night. Uh, we had staff from the Louisville Metro, Louisville Metro Advanced Planning Sustainability who were able to add uh, input to that discussion that was taking place at that meeting. We also had in attendance Councilwoman uh, Purvis. I think she is District 5, uh, Shawnee District, uh, uh, at that public meeting. So it was a lot of good discussion. Uh, Michelle and her staff are already hard at work at putting together a uh, workshop series for 2020. You know, I cannot stress enough uh, that uh, board members, as you are able to make those meetings, please make them for folks in the audience. Those are great opportunities for public engagement to ask questions, to hear about the work that we do. Uh, and it's a very informal setting, so you can catch us one-on-one -on -one during the meeting, after the meeting, and it's just a great opportunity for community engagement. So I, I really can't stress enough the fact that we would like to have as many people as, as possible uh, attend those meetings. The other thing that we're gonna do is we wanna work on our successes with that engagement process and engagement series, and then we want to, to learn from our mistakes. So one thing, and Michelle, you can correct me, but I think we will avoid uh, meetings during the summer. We had a low turnout during the summer, and that's just because so many people have so many other things going on during the summer. So you live and you learn, uh, but we're looking forward to this opportunity, something that we plan to continue, uh, build on, and to grow. I want to take this opportunity, and I'm still just reaction thunder, but I wanted to alert the board that the West Jefferson County Community Task Force Environmental Justice Conference will take place December 3rd from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Simmons College at 1000 South 4th Street. The theme this year is climate change, environmental justice, investing in our future. Uh, the fe featured speaker this year will be Jackie Patterson, who is the National Chair for the NAACP Environmental Climate Justice. Uh, as always, this is a well-attended and informative event. There is still opportunity uh, for you to sign up. You can go to West Jefferson's webpage, or you can call 502-645-3588, and they will be able to get you signed up for attending that meeting. Again, it is always a great meeting. There is good discussion. Always a lot of community folks there, and just a good opportunity to discuss uh, an issue in terms of environmental justice that we all know uh, needs to be addressed. Before I forget, I also want to thank board members uh, Steve Sullivan and Dr. Jeffrey Cobra for accepting their roles as co-chairs for the Multi Pollutant uh, Stakeholder Group. Uh, we, we appreciate that opportunity, and I think it's important that our board members are involved uh, for a couple of reasons. Primarily because it gives them the opportunity uh, as issues that, that arise in terms of us addressing those on this community come before the board. We'll have a couple of board members who will have first-hand knowledge of the discussions that take place in that process so they can talk about what community said, how they felt about different issues, and bring that perspective to the board as we consider the decisions that, that come before you. So uh, again, I just want to uh, personally thank you guys for accepting that, that responsibility. Just as a, an update, the first uh, multi-pollutant uh, stakeholder group process meeting was held uh, November 6th. Uh, we had great turnout for that, for that meeting, and it was just a meeting to try to bring that group up to speed to provide them as much information as possible about ozone, about the work that's already been done, a little bit about APCD and how this process will work. Additionally, uh, there will be a second meeting today from three to five of that group, uh, and again, just to, to provide information and understanding of the issue that they're gonna, gonna be discussing. And this is also a, a perfect segue uh, into the last part of the director's report, 
which we are, will be a presentation by <coughs> Rambo, uh, as they present their findings from the off-discussed and anticipated ozone study. I, I brought this to your attention on, on numerous occasions. We have a final report, and we have an opportunity uh, this morning from Ms. Courtney Keller to uh, present to the board on that issue. So if there are no further questions from the board for me for uh, what I've presented so far, we'll pro pro uh, proceed with that presentation. Good morning, everyone. Is this a good time for a presentation? Uh oh, the lights are going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to not put you all to sleep. I'm Courtney Taylor. I'm with Randall. I've had the absolute pleasure of working with the folks at the APCD over the last six months or so, and I'm thrilled to be able to present some of the key highlights from our study to you. We kind of dance to the next slide. And I also did this study, of course, with a whole group of people. So teachers, Marco, and Fred Yarrow were some of the common contributors to the work that we're presenting today. Um, we'll start out with just a little bit of an overview of the ozone study. For those of you not familiar with the study in the background, we'll talk in more detail about the emissions inventory. Oh, thank you. Great. Let's test it out. All right, we'll talk in some more detail about the emissions inventory developed for the study and then some of the findings from the sensitivity model and using emissions. For those of you that are not as familiar with the ozone formation study, essentially the goal of the study is to better help Louisville understand um, ozone formation within Louisville Jefferson County and then to be able to use that information to inform policy. Here for the, for the specific objectives that were done for the study, we had three objectives. This was the work that we've done. We'll be talking about objectives one and three in this abbreviated presentation today. Essentially what we've done is we've developed an emissions inventory suitable for ozone modeling, and then we've used that ozone model, assessed the model, make sure it's suitable for the area, and then we've used that model as a tool to further better understand our, our understanding of the ozone formation globally. We'll be talking again about one, points one and three. Um, so the emissions inventory was developed specific to our area. When we're talking about an emissions inventory for ozone modeling purposes, it's a comprehensive emissions inventory. We try not to recreate the wheel when we're doing ozone modeling, so we've used um, and leveraged available emissions data from the US EPA on the National Emissions Inventory. And this was, we, we've selected year 2016 as the most current emissions inventory that was available when we started this study. The 2016 beta inventory is what we've used, and we've enhanced and refined that inventory with information specific to the Louisville area when we have a complete set of data, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. This inventory includes ozone precursors, most <coughs> importantly, nitrogen oxides, NOx, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, are what we use for the ozone model, and then the emissions inventory is comprehensive. It does contain all other pollutants, including pollutants that participate in formation processes for PM2.5. We developed <clears throat> and used this inventory for the ozone season, which it is defined for the purposes of our study from March to October. So the emissions inventory from US EPA is listed on the left-hand side, and it, it contains literally all the emissions that could for, be foreseen. Um, it includes man-made emissions as well as natural biogenic emissions. And on the right-hand side, we've talked about, we list the types of improvements that were made to the emissions inventory specific to the Louisville area. In particular, we enhanced the on-road emissions SAR sector for a five county area, including, um, we started with Oldham, Jefferson, and Bullitt County in Kentucky, and then we also, and Craig's not gonna he, he did this for us, thank you, um, and also Floyd and Clark County in Indiana. And mobile sources are literally like all your cars and trucks, that's, that's all the emission sources from cars and trucks if you wanna think about it that way. We also updated and refined emissions inventory where we had complete and comprehensive emissions. Louisville had complete comprehensive emissions from reported to them from the industries. And this list was um, bulk, bulk gas terminals and plants, as well as public data treatment works, 
industrial natural gas combustion and landfill and debris. And it's a kind of a strange assortment, but, but these are the types of source categories where we have a full comprehensive emission inventory from which we can update what EPA has as default for this area. What we have here is basically a spatial plot that shows what those spatial distribution of emissions look like that we're fed into the model. On the left-hand side, we have our NOx emissions inventory, and on the right-hand side, we have our VOC emissions. And um, on the VOC slide, you can actually see Louisville as a little bit of a high, high point of VOCs within the mixture of other compounds. But within the NOx emissions inventory, it kind of blends in with other urban sources. So with that, we use that emissions inventory to conduct our ozone modeling. What you see is this movie is kind of shows the, the results of the ozone model. These are hourly ozone concentrations. And you can see Louisville is in the center here. Um, and you'll be able to see the ozone form in the afternoon and then get deplete after the sun goes down and the photoreactivity ceases. This was an event that we selected. It's the date of July 18th and 19th. And on the top, you can see the basically the concentrations that were measured. Actually, these are modeled concentrations at the Cannons Lane site throughout July 18th and, and the day of the 19th. Um, we selected this particular event to show you because this is an event where the model performs well. So what we're seeing here in these plots is fairly indicative of, of what we expect to actually occur on July 18th and 19th. And you can see these red spots are um, ozone formation buildup and then subsequent transport outside of the Louisville area. I'll just give it a little second. So here's a buildup event. And then here you can see the ozone getting transported downwind and then the ozone depleting once the sun sets. So that was a kind of a snapshot of what it looked like. And now what we did is we used the model and, um, to further analyze and understand what is the sensitivity of ozone to VOC emissions on one side and NOx emissions on the other side. We wanted to understand how these two different types of emissions precursors contribute to the ozone formed in our area. So what we've done in order to assess this is we did two sensitivity cases where we adjusted the emissions and we decreased the NOx emissions by 25% in one case, and we decreased the VOC emissions by 25% in the other case. So if you recall those plots of NOx and VOC emissions, um, imagine that the this, this spatial distribution is the same, just the magnitude of the emissions is, is decreased by about 25%. And I, I guess I should mention that we decreased only the man-made emissions. So natural VOC emissions were remain unchanged. What we are going to do with this, these sensitivity tests, is we run the model with these adjusted emissions, and then we compare it with the actual emissions in 2016 and ozone results. And we do essentially a difference. So we have our, our reduced emissions case, and we have our, our actual emissions case, and we do a difference. And so when you see negative values, that means that the ozone has decreased in response to decreased emissions. Okay, so, and, and there are cases and situations where the ozone does increase in response to decrease in emissions. It's kind of a complicated situation. We're not going to be talking about those, that perturbation, those changes here, but um, we're going to focus on cases where the decrease in emissions causes a decrease in ozone concentration, which is important for the overall peaks, and, and so it's, a, it's appropriate. If you want more details, I forgot to mention that the report's online, so <laughs> this is just the highlights version. And we, when we did this analysis, we focused exclusively on those days with the high ozone concentrations. We look, we're looking only at the top 10 ozone days when we're doing this difference. And so what I'd first like to point out is on the left-hand side, we have a plot of the difference in the NOx sensitivity test minus our actual case. And the whole plot is blue, which indicates, as you can see kind of from this bar uh, kind of legend, Essentially, anything that's red would indicate an increase in ozone, but the whole plot everywhere is blue, which indicates that uniformly when NOx emissions reductions were applied, ozone decreased in response to decreased emissions, which makes sense and is good. That's what we want to see. What I think is important to note is that the maximum decrease, that darkest blue, is actually not in Kentucky. So you can kind of see, if I apologize, it's hard to see Kentucky's right here, and Louisville's right here in the center. So the maximum decrease in um, in NOx or in ozone 
concentrations in response to Knox is actually outside of Kentucky. And the, act, the, the maximum decrease is just 6.2 parts per billion just for mental note. Um, well, the maximum decrease in Jefferson County was a 3.8 ppb. And what we're showing on this right hand side is a zoom in of Jefferson County. And oh, you can't see it at all, I apologize. But basically these little dots are the monitors, the ozone monitors, and this one is Pam's Lane. And what I think is important about this plot is the darker colors indicate larger decreases, which is what we want. Importantly, in the vicinity of Cannons Lane and the heart of Louisville, kind of along the river, that's the river here, um, that you're seeing that the emissions decreases cause a little less ozone reduction than in the corresponding areas. So ozone reductions are not as impactful in the heart of, of Louisville as they are in the surrounding areas. Um, I think we'll just, but I think with, well, what I do want to make sure to say is that this 3.8 ppb, is kind of keep that in your head, that's kind of the, the range is about three to four ppb of ozone reduction attributed to NOx. Now when we look at VFC, we're looking at the same types of plots. This is our four kilometer domain, this is Kentucky. What you see is the plot is predominantly white, meaning that ozone reduction is fairly non-responsive to the VFC emission changes. In contrast to the NOx plot, where the NOx peaked in the southern portion, you'll see that the most color you can see is actually in the heart of Louisville. So in Louisville itself, it's most responsive to VOCs relative to their surrounding, VOC emission reductions relative to their surrounding areas. When you look at the VOC sensitivity plot, here you can see the outline better of where we're at in Jefferson County. Here's Cannons Lane. The surrounding area is a lighter color, and the, the most um, color is in near Cannons Lane. That means that VOC emission reduction measures are most effective in that area of Louisville. And the magnitude of those reductions is about 1.3. So in a nutshell, VOC emission reductions are more effective in Louisville relative to NOx. But I guess I want to make sure to say that the overall point is that even though they're more effective compared to the region, they are still overall slightly less effective, about 1 ppb of ozone change, as opposed to NOx reductions are about 3, three to 4. One last technical slide for you all. When we look at this by day at Cannons Lane, this line shows the one the one line. And so what I'm presenting here, these dots, the blue dots are the, the emission reductions attributed that happen when the NOx emissions change. And the orange dots are the ozone changes, sorry, the ozone changes in response to VOC. So blue is NOx, orange is VOC. Anything less than the one to one line is a deep and importantly, most of the orange dots are fairly close to the one-on-one -on -one line, meaning most of the time, ozone is not responsive to VOC emission control. And the NOx, the blue dots are further away, you're getting a bigger emission, um, ozone reduction for your emission reductions. The exception being on a few days, there are periods where it flips and the VOC is more effective than the NOx at reducing ozone. And um, I think that's really where we have ended this kind of highlighted version of the presentation. If you'd like more information, we'll be presenting a modified version um, later. Just to recap, um, we developed an emissions inventory, refined that inventory for this area. The model has acceptable performance for ozone, and that the regional emissions are most sensitive to NOx emission reduction measures for the most of the part that's on a few days where they're very powerful. And that's it. <laughs> so when you reduce the level of VOC tenoxin model, did you just use twenty five percent or did you vary that number to see if that's sensitive? No, we we only tried that one case um, of really looking at emission reductions across the board. So imagine this plot but instead of having the reds be 10, they were like 7.5. So everything would be kind of suppressed by about 25 any feeling that the amount of decrease is critical to its effect? Definitely. There, there are nonlinear effects. So, so if you change that amount, you can get 
different levels of response. And I think so. So if you get 20, you, so what we're showing here is a 25 percent NOx decrease is about a three to four ppb. You can decrease it by 10 percent and not get. So it, it, so it's not it's not what it would be one or two. Yeah, it's not proportional. That's a great question. So how does the reduction of the 3.8 ppb? How is that relevant to the to the limits? I mean, if you achieve that reduction, it would be meaningful. Yeah. So for, for, for design value, seventy two ppb. Okay. So what are we? That's for that three year period. Yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 Yeah.
part of the reason why it's a health concern is it's reactive in our lungs as well. And so when the absence of sunlight, the ozone is actually depleted and it, it disappears. It reacts and forms essentially oxygen and nitrogen dioxide is one of the so it goes in a reverse reaction? It, it's exactly. Okay. Yeah, so. yeah. So it goes in the reverse reaction, and then those compounds, they they are kind of stick around, and they're still available so that once the sun comes back up, it kicks off again. Dr. May, at the presentation that was made at the multi gluten stakeholder mm -hmm. group last, well, two weeks ago, um, Byron Gary included a really nice uh, kind of depiction of that chemical reaction. Those. The presentation that we made is posted under the multiple stakeholder group link on our webpage, but I'll also send a link out to the board and let you know which where to find that in the slide there. Um, it is an incredibly complex equation. Billy DeWitt is uh, ABCD's director of uh, air monitoring and our meteorologist. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, just know that you know, preliminary data suggests that this Last year we were at the same monitor, we were 77 parts per million, which is well over the standard. I think uh, a big play in that is essentially the meteorology. As Colby mentioned, we had a lot of our hot, intense sun days had you know, higher wind speeds or higher humidity or both. And both of those things play into, into part of the ozone formation. Humidity scavenges ozone, uh, the wind speed in, in directional, obviously, uh, move precursors out of the area or not. Any other questions? Do, yeah. do the VOCs and the ops mix evenly throughout the, 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 the air column? Um, for the most part, it, it's, really you part. know, there are vertical changes in both of those emissions, but um, it depends on where it's released in the meteorology. But we, the model does a great job. It's actually um, a gridded model that has layers vertically, so it captures those vertical changes and allows for the emissions to get mixed both horizontally and vertically. Um, but, but there are differences, definitely. It just depends on the day. I have a few questions. Um, <coughs> the inventory for the VOCs, is that total VOCs? That's you know, it, it further uh, broken down. It is. Yeah, so what we've used is the EPA default speciation that depends on the industry that's releasing those VOCs. And so it, it is broken into essentially reactivity based um, composition. I see. So the inventory gives you total VOCs, and then through the, <coughs> from the nature of the industry around here, you use EPA profiles. So that's exactly right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the three or four PPB reduction and the one to two PPB reduction on the floor, as I understand it, so that would be on, on the peak concentration in, in the highest days of the season. Right? That's right. The top ten days, exactly. The top ten days. We looked at the top, and that's the average of the top ten days. So, so, so that's around 70 parts per billion or a little bit above. Yeah, it, it, it can be. So I think probably the best plot to see is, um, so it peaked out at about 80, 82 to, to 87 on those peak ones. So it's still there. But of course, as the design value, we're looking at the fourth highest in the season. So one, two, three, four. So your peak values are still, with both emission reduction cases, using the model setup that we did, they're still above this line of 70. So they were about 72 and 74, roughly, with either of the sensitivity cases. So it still would be predicting some level of exceedance. I think it would be interesting to put a mark for the, for the limit on there. Visually. I know, seven. you're right. Oops, when I was just doing that plot, I'm like, that would have been a good addition. So here's this yeah. 70, and shoop. Anything above this is above the standard. Yeah. Well, so, so in yeah. each of the cases of VOCs and not, you have a twenty-five percent reduction <coughs> in the local emissions or actually the region. Um uniformly. And then depending on whether it's NOX or VOCs, you get a few percent reduction in those of concentration. Exactly. And, and uh, I think I know the answer to this, but um, you, you didn't try uniformly 
thought for sure. Correct. We did yeah. not do that type of a case. Yeah, why not? Um, I think that you know we were we were getting initial results to help inform what you guys would like to look at next, and, and we didn't know that this wouldn't be sufficient of itself to like show a claim. And I think this was, I mean, originally you can talk about that too. The goals of this study were really just to better understand all the information as opposed to a control strategy. But so, just to address that question a little bit more. <coughs> If we were to not make that attainment deadline, mm -hmm. then would, we would be required by EPA regulation to do modeling to show what it would take to get us into attainment. But prior to that deadline, our goal wasn't too much to see what would get us into attainment, like what, what case would get us there. The primary purpose of the study is to understand just which of those generally would be a more effective reduction. Um, so that's something that we may end up having to look at depending on what our ozone is, you know, next year. Uh, um, but just because the goal wasn't necessarily to do that sort of regulatory modeling to demonstrate what would get us into compliance, so much as just a more general understanding, since we aren't required to do that yet. And this is actually a more detailed study of a more of a broader study that's been done in Southeast USA, and as part of that larger study, what they determined was that. Uh, nitrogen oxide emissions really drove ozone formation throughout the southeast. But they always kind of put a little footnote at the bottom and said, well, global may be a little bit different. And that could be because of the sources that we have here specific to our industries. And so we wanted to kind of better understand at a um, sort of a 30,000 foot view level at a much longer look at a more refined level what ozone formation is here in the world. What actually drives it? Is it volatile organic compounds or is it nitrogen oxides? It's strongly nitrogen oxides and a little bit of volatile organic compounds. So that, that footnote actually was a, an accurate assessment. But to what degree, I guess? I mean, it, 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 that may be something you know, that in the future right, is going to I appreciate to. that it may be different here, but is it vastly different? California. If I realize it's a question that wasn't answered. I mean, maps show that everywhere else in the southeast is white on maps. They get basically no benefit from GOC reductions anywhere southeast. Right. Um, so we're different from that, but not vastly different. But not vastly or we're not at a where NOx reduction is actually causing an increase in ozone. Right. Except on one or two days, I think, where we said. Yeah, there were some. Of course, uh, the strategy of uh, reducing NOx emissions or VOC emissions are both by 25% over the entire region. It's not really available. To That's the true. Us because yeah. we reduce emissions here. So, uh, did you look at just uh, <clears throat> assuming that these uh, emission reductions occur locally and left, left the regional city? Did you look at that? Yeah, um, so kind of uh, on both of, of those points, um, to your first point of what's available to us, um, we certainly recognize that APCD and uh, the companies that operate here in terms of county can only impact emissions here, but um, we think it's important for us to have that bigger picture because we do have partners that we work with, such as the Division for Air Quality and the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. And so this is, great information for us and is going to be a key piece of our um, emission reduction planning, whether that be in a SIP um, kind of planning setting or uh, more of a local, uh, our own goals going forward. We also know that this is also going to be a very helpful study to our partners. And so um, having that wider region uh, view is still important to those conversations and to planning. Um, to your second question, that is a next step that we're looking at taking. Uh, what is the effect of a 25% uh, emission reduction in NOx just from the Jefferson County sources, or the VOCs just from the Jefferson County? And 25% being sort of the marker of how responsive will that be? Will that, you know, is that going to get us anywhere? It's sort of a first cut screening question before we have to get to something more like what Byron described earlier. It's a, a more specific, refined analysis that is a part of our submittal to. So it's kind of a stage, um, and so the 
your second question is our, that's our next stage. So that's exactly what um, these initial results have um, started that conversation. To follow up on Michelle's point of how important this is for our partners, we'd be remiss if we didn't know the Deputy, Deputy Commissioner Sean Altieri from the Kentucky Energy and Environmental Protection Cabinet is joining us today, and the Director for the Division of Air Quality will join us together this afternoon. So we really appreciate you all being here and joining us as we look at this study and, and work together to improve air quality. Any other questions? Uh, and you may have already answered this, uh, what you were talking about to define uh, this a little bit more. You were saying that uh, we should talk about what we have to talk about the area as opposed to what we have in the area. Would that even account and you define it even a little bit more to specific areas in this area where emissions are higher that would contribute to that, to the VOCs? Would the ozone levels actually affect that area more than another area? It may not, I mean, just, just a question. Billy would be better able to answer that question about his understanding of ozone formation across the county. Because it's a secondary pollution, uh, global chemical reaction, as Courtney mentioned, a lot of the areas where the emissions are highest it may not be the area where the ozone forms because of the predominant direction of the wind is going to begin forming. Uh, the wind usually comes out of the southwest formation there but really get higher and higher if that winds in that direction the northeast would receive the highest ozone so a lot of depends on wind direction and movement of the air and health problems. And thank you. Because we're getting what needed to be said a lot we don't know that the wind is a whole lot The photochemical assessment monitoring that we've done at our planet's land air monitoring site in conjunction with the air toxics monitoring that's being done at the firearms training site. It's going to give us additional that question. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, very uh, detailed and excellent report. Yeah, question? Yeah, uh, so the reference documents are involved in A, B, and C, available? Yeah, but um, we have the, the publicly available report. Is that what you're going to be at, you're asking Well, about? the reference documents with, that are noted within. Ramball A, B, and C, which are the oh, uh, emissions okay. inventory okay. And information. Are those publicly like available? The, um, uh, we haven't posted the emissions inventory document yet, um, but I think at this point it would be. Uh, we'd have to have a discussion about that, but I, I don't see why it wouldn't be able to be made available. All right. Uh, and also, in converting the annual point source data to shorter term, mm -hmm. can you explain the methodology or what you use? for the short term? Absolutely. So the um, there's kind of two different buckets of data availability to do what's called taking that annual information and, and putting it hourly, essentially. So one is large facilities with a continuous emissions monitoring system, a SEMS. That, that data set collects hourly data, hourly emissions. So when SEMS data is available, we use that in, you know, instead of the annual total. Other information um, is used when there's just annual totals. That information is estimated at an hourly level using what's called profiles. So basically we understand how much people are driving during different periods of the day based on community patterns. And so those day of week and time of day profiles are applied to the data. So it's very general, standard default information that's used. Sure. Um, I know that you replaced the global specific emissions inventory in the EPA database. Was that using the 2016 emissions inventory or the 2017 data? It was the 2016 data that we've used from 